Good evening, this is Gary Kavner here on the right side. I'm here today with my friend and colleague, Michael Dwyer. Here are the stories we're going to be covering today. Ryan Tuberty has said something controversial for possibly the first time in his life, and it was not about a sweater. It was in fact about Greta Thunberg, who spoke recently at the UN. We're going to talk about that, and Greta Thunberg in general and her speech. The Democrats have finally found their balls and decided they're actually going to try and impeach Trump, by which I mean they're going to set up a preliminary investigation into impeaching Trump that may lead somewhere, but almost assuredly will not <laughs> Will not. Will it? Will it, Gary? Oh, God. Yeah. Will it? In my defence to, to the listener, we record these very early. And finally, we want to close on the news that the IOC, who have been trying to put together new guidelines for transgender uh, activists, appear to be mired in some sort of quagmire. The situation is so political, no one can agree on anything, but we want to just give you an idea of what they're considering. So, Ryan Tuberty. Hey, we're all right. Ryan, Ryan came out and he had seen the speech of Greta Thunberg speaking at the UN. And he said that uh, Greta Thunberg, he really wished she would just go home and read a book or walk the dog or do something well, I like think that. that sorry, he mis- slightly misconstrued the context. He said, speaking as a father, if he saw his daughter, 16-year-old, so full of pain and so contorted and so upset... If he'd say, look, you know, maybe it's time to go home, watch a video, go for a walk with your mum and dad. He was, I think, concerned for the the well-being, the emotional well-being of the person in question as much as... Uh, yeah, yeah his, his exact quote was, it's not good for her mental health or her well-being. I saw her face contorted in pain and agony and anxiety. I was watching her, and I was not thinking about the climate. I was thinking about my daughter. That's uh, which is obviously a sh- horrible thing to to say. It's an incredibly. Ryan Tuberty quote here is a uh, Ryan quote is only feeding into this terrible negativity that this young woman is receiving online. He needs to realize that his opinions carry weight. He should make a sincere and frank apology. So not just a sincere. Or Frank, but since you're and Frank. Was that from uh, that green councillor, Peter That Gavin? was from that, that, the brightest star in the academic firmament of the Green Party, Peter Kavanagh, yeah. He's the man who... He, uh, he keeps on giving, Gary. He keeps on giving. Yeah, well, I don't think we have any real need to discuss but, Peter well, no, Kavanagh. We, we don't. He's a lovely man and, 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 and a fine councillor. But he also... We would expect a little more empathy... But precisely, I'm sorry. Maybe empathy means a different thing in in the world inhabited by. I'm I'm gonna be I'm gonna be perfectly frank here. From any time I've ever had to look about what Kavanagh is saying, Councillor Kavanagh, not not me. I am a better Kavanagh in every way. <laughs> um, okay. Any time I've ever had to look at what he's saying, I haven't thought, you know what, that is a man entrenched in a deep tradition of empathy for people on opposing sides of issues to him. Well, that, that may, may indeed be the case that the, the councillor is a, a dedicated and combative uh, voice for the green issues. But I would have thought that the, po- the whole point of his uh, criticism is that Brian Tuberty was being excessively empathetic rather than being analytic and distanced, that he was simply engaging with this figure as a human person and engaging with the apparent discomfort and pain that they were experiencing and empathising. I mean, I I was really interested to see this speech purely because I was interested to see what the reaction of Americans would be to Greta and Thunberg. It was because just, in many yeah. ways, America is a more serious political country than most yes. of Europe. Like they actually believe in things which most of Europe and most European politicians don't. So it's curious if if this child comes over and starts saying things, where will people on both sides? They fall? also have to. They also know things. I mean, I I, I just want quickly to point. I've had the the fortune and misfortune to meet a number of pro-American politicians, senate, ex senators couple of Congress people. And I can tell you, the thing, you meet these and you're told afterwards, oh no, they're not anything particular or special. They are so well briefed, researched, informed. This notion of, you know, you're the dumb American, which is such a lazy stereotype and cliche. These guys, in comparison to our politicians, oh, they were so, uh, so impressive. No, I'm not saying they all are, 
and maybe I was lucky, but generally speaking, they know things. And if they think you don't know things, they will gently or ungently point that out. Yes, it was I, going to be interesting when Greta comes in and makes her speech, which is all basically, it's a boat floating on a sea of emotion. There is this sort of, why are we listening to a child touting scientific facts at us? Surely if we were actually interested, we would just call the scientists. But I I watched the speech. I think it's gr- she's growing a little bit thin. Well, yeah, but do you not think... I mean, I remember when I came across Greta the first 18 months ago, I I think was the first time my, my she crossed my radar. And I thought at the time, well, other than I thought many things at the time would be a bit odd and a bit maybe, but I thought, you know, the, this works with a little girl. This works with a kid. And I think it's curious and not coincidental that they have maintained, you know, the, the hairstyle and the general demeanour and the dress. Now, that may be part of her own personality as well and part of her issues, that she is young for her age. But she's now getting to the point where she's become a teenager. And I remember thinking, I thought at the time, all of this lecturing and passion you can take from a child prophet. From a teenager, it just come, it's going to increasingly come across as angry, whiny te- teenager tells words, I hate you, I hate you, and you don't really love me at all. You know, we get plenty of those. Yeah, I think she's, she's her handlers and are very clearly... Uh, you saw when she was speaking to the Senate. Yeah. Um, I think was that they're clearly choosing choices that emphasise her youth, and I think it's for that reason. They don't want her going into sort of angry teenager mode. But it was a, it was not a terribly good speech. None of her speeches are terribly good. They only really get by because uh, of the public opinion yeah. of her and the fact she's a child. But that's got a time limit on it. Yeah, that goes, that goes off. Um, and I don't think... This sort of angry verge of tears kind of speech. You have stolen my childhood and my dreams. Uh, firstly, I don't think it's true. If anyone stole her childhood and her dreams, it was her parents who let this get to this stage. But I did like um, Robert P. George, who is a um, he is a um, philosopher, American. He's a Princeton uh, professor. He, his take on it was that there were going to be two kinds of people after it. Those who find when they watch the video that it's deeply moving and regard Greta Thunberg as a prophet and perhaps a saint. And those who are outraged by what they regard as the indoctrination, manipulation and ex- exploitation of a child. And Tuberty, I think, may actually hit both of these at the same time. He probably thinks very highly of Thunberg. But to watch a girl basically come apart on stream... Yeah. And Thunberg didn't get here on her own. Thunberg has people behind her. She has organizations behind her. She has people advising her. She has people writing her speeches. So people who, frankly, are putting a great deal of pressure on a 16-year-old child of any kind of And it seems the positions are getting more and more extreme and more and more... And therefore are going to become... I'm going to be met with less and less sympathy. I think... Yeah, I mean, we we talked about the, the guys behind the global strike and and their demands and how they don't it's it is kind of deep green there are too many people some of you are going to have to die and we don't like but technology so we're not going to do it I, did I, I got it right that she's looking for the end of fossil fuels in so eight and a half years yeah which would be um how is not a serious but, proposition well, it's basically. either not serious or very serious indeed for the hundreds of kill, people that would kill millions of people, at the very least. Uh, it, it would be nightmare. The, the reduction in food yield on its own that that would cause would cause famine like thing we haven't seen since the Stalin period. Oh, it would be. You, you, you'd see, you would see famine. Or since Mao decided he didn't like sparrows. God, look at the days. Everywhere, in the th- anywhere in the third world would, would experience famine. Anywhere in the deve- parts of the developing world would have sort of the intermediate part, what used to be the second world, would have some. We, we would survive, but we, our, the cost of, our cost of living and our general quality of living would decline precipitously. And for, for the listener, if they're curious why that is, it's partially because cheap energy is, is the largest driver of prosperity we've ever seen, but it's also because petrochemicals are an incredibly important part of the modern world. 
and to simply remove them in eight years is not possible. But then again, this is someone, her mother once said that she could see carbon in the atmosphere, which is just, or CO2 in the atmosphere, which is just nonsense. Like, it's just not a thing. It's the kind of thing that you, once upon a time, would have ascribed to a, a, saint, a medieval saint child. And yeah. this she is the equivalent of it. Yeah, you can see the spirits in the yeah. air. And the spirits are angry. Yeah. And, oh my, did you hear the introductory speech? The, the I did. I, 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 I want to say he was, he was director, the director, uh, director of the, the general of the United Nations. May, maybe it was. If not, the, the first line of the speech was, "Nature is angry," and he went on and talked about the fires and talked about everything. Now, this this is actually one of the things that really pisses the, the, me off about the movement. This is really scary this stuff, though. Gaia hypothesis, the planet is aware. Also, this thing about the planet being destroyed. The planet has survived meteor impacts. It survived ice ages. It survived being a molten ball. It's not going to be destroyed by a five degree increase in climate. The only damage that can happen is to habitability for humans. Mm -hmm. right. Humans but the conversation seems to have become this sort of the well, yes, other creatures. But the planet is going to be fine. But this level of anthropomorphism, personalizing the the the, the planet is kind of scary and pre-modern and old-fashioned pagan. And you, you're a little bit waiting for the wicker man. And who are they going to sacrifice to ensure that the rains come next year? It's really unsettling. Grown up people in a, in, in, a, in a modern age, in a post modern age, are actually talking, oh, Mother Earth is angry. We're going to throw somebody into the volcano and see if we can calm her down. I, 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 you know, Bjorn Lomborg, the, not, he's, a, he's not a climate change skeptic, but he's a, he's a skeptic regarding the methodologies being employed to deal with it. But he was. He is he's actually the sort of person we don't see enough in the modern environmentalist movement who says, Your projections are right. Here is what your policies would actually yeah. do. And there just seems to be this bizarre thing of you either agree fully or you don't agree at all. We're talking to lots of people who think that anthropomorphic climate change is real and the projections are probably right within certain provisos. But just think that the modern grief movement offers absolutely no chance to fix but the it. Well, I think one, the other problem is that uh, there is once you get on board with the premise of uh, of anthropogenic climate change, and you get on board with the predictions, and we should pass in observance that all of the predictions pretty well have been wrong and fairly dramatically wrong. So, I mean, how much can for? For about 50 yeah, for years. years. The, so the amount of confidence we should invest in this, it should, it should be tempered. But implied in this is, okay, this is true, so this is the answer. And everybody just has to get on board with the answer, which is get rid of all carbon, get rid of all CO2, get rid of all... Rather than having... So, you're not allowed to say, well, actually, you. Know, I think that would be really bad. Can we... Are there other ways? Or are are there other costs we need to consider? Do we have to consider the number of you know, of, of mortality, excess mortality? No, that's there's, there's no no. Sort of, that's quibbling. You have to I, get on I've, with it. Do it. I have heard people make the argument that uh, all right. Well, what if if climate change isn't as we say, and we just build a better world? Is that would that be so mm -hmm. terrible? And you and this, you have to go yes, because some of the consequences of what you're saying. Will kill people. Absolutely. I mean, this whole, like, the climate strike, the cl the point that there should be no technological corporate solution to climate change. Yeah. The fact that they say there should be no nuclear, no hydro. No techno fixes. All of those. Is the word. No techno So no fixes. carbon capture. No, I... No carbon capture. They call it carbon capture specifically. Um, and, I don't know, because they, they capture, don't like trees, maybe? But that's the thing. Carbon capture is possibly... Creating, pumping it into the earth, creating these lumps of stone infused with carbon, then buried on. Oh, but at the largest scale of carbon capture, and the current buzz idea on the basis of a radar study that was published there a couple of weeks ago is that we actually can address the carbon uh, pro carbon dioxide problem in the air with 
a very extensive planting of trees and it's extensive but not so extensive as was previously thought but that would be carbon capture and they say no they don't want that but so they're underneath this what seems to be happening is we're looking essentially at a religious cult a religious movement which really doesn't I believe that the that it's our lifestyle, the way we live, the economy, and the, the kind and the kind of way we grow and generate wealth is that's the problem. As Miss Thunberg says, are chasing our fairy tales of eternal growth. Yeah, I mean, you have you, you, it's it's not difficult to read a lot of what Britta says and to hear the vo- the, the voices of Marx and Engels here. That and I we one one wonders through whom they have been channeled. But poor old Ryan, the point is Ryan Ryan made what seemed to me perfectly reasonable point and has been hammered. Now it's worth pointing out that uh, RT have also said that they have have not up to now received any formal complaints, but it's happening on social media that all of this bruha ha and uh, the, the the old greens are good at the old bruja. Yeah, not great on follow but, on or actually knowing what they're talking about beyond a couple of sound bites. But yeah, bruja has. We have uh, we have spoke of uh, Greta. I did. Now I will say this: I did find Trump's response to her very funny. Yes, and deliberately. There's a video I, online of just Greta kind of staring at Trump as he just walks by her, and then his description of her was a. Uh, she seems like a very happy young girl looking forward to a bright and wonderful future. Which is a wonderful way of going. Well, we were all forced to sit through that nonsense, but uh, let's move on now. But yet, you, that's the thing. America is a much more serious country. Yeah. And they're not going to do what the British Parliament did and stand around basically crying and waiting to touch the hem of her garment mm. so they may be absolved of their sins. The Americans on both sides are just going to go, we have scientists here. Yeah. 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 Why are you here? And yeah, the, the sarcasm, uh, Trump, the, the, the Trump sarcasm was just glorious. It really was laid on like two inches of butter on a slice of cake. It was, it was absolutely edible. Greta uh, I will say this that Greta Thunberg has now changed her Twitter bio to a very happy young girl looking to a brighter, wonderful future. By which I mean that Greta Thunberg's handlers have changed her. Twitter uh, profile. Indeed. To that. However, it's not all. It's not all uh, jokes and fun and in the front of the fair for President Trump at the moment, is it? No, the Democrats have finally. Well, Nancy Pelosi has finally been pushed into starting. Uh, well, starting the impeachment process uh, against Trump. Sorry, they were just saying. Somebody said to me recently that uh, all she. Somebody said to me they pulled the trigger on it. No, no, they haven't pulled the trigger. What they've done is they set up a, a preliminary committee to examine the feasibility of going on to a finger, to a to a trigger pulling exercise, because this is so far away from actually getting towards an impeachment that you know I think that there's, we need the papers need to calm down a little bit here. Now it'll fill and it'll fill a lot of talk radio and fill a lot of papers, but we're not that close. It seems to me. The, to an actual impeachment. But what, what, what's no, the I mean, basis? This, this again, is, I mean, we, we seem to me uh, we've so, had so many different... They just said, well, no, okay, we this is why we want to impeach him. We know. Well, oh, okay, well, actually, one of that was this. And, and no, no, not quite that, but this, but also that. So where are we now? It's something to do with the Ukraine. So, yeah, the internal factions of the Democratic Party have been pushing for this for a long time, and Pelosi has always held off on it. Um because she believes it's not politically useful. And also they don't have the numbers to actually force this yeah. through unless a lot of the Republicans also defect. And considering that Trump's Trump's favorability amongst the Republican elites is not great. They don't like him. They think he's an odious yes. person for the most part. His support level amongst the Republican base is in the 90s. Yeah. Like it is an incredible level of support. They are... They were, the first few years, they were, weren't a bit sure about him, but now they are fully behind Trump. And the Republicans are highly unlikely to break in numbers. Well, so Pelosi knows, next year, even if this happens, year. it's, yeah. But Pelosi, his, his approval ratings, I think, now are higher than Obama's were. 
going into the, his second election. Like, uh, but it's largely dependent upon the economy. If the economy goes down, Trump's in probably real trouble. So anyway, yes, th- what's happened is that it's alleged that Trump pressured the Ukrainian president to investigate uh, Joe Biden effectively. Um, so and uh, people are saying, well, this is an attempt to undermine Biden uh, before he can, uh, because they think he'll be the likely Democratic candidate for 2020, and this would just scrap him. Now, what happened here is a whistleblower lodged a formal complaint saying there had been phone calls between Trump and the Ukrainian president uh, Zelensky, uh, saying that they wanted to look into it, and that Trump threatened to withdraw military aid to Ukraine unless Zelensky agreed to uh, investigate corruption allegations. Mm -hmm. So the corruption allegations are this. During the Obama administration, when Joe Biden was vice president, there's video of Joe Biden saying that he uh, told the Ukrainians to sack a um, an investigator before he would release funds to Ukraine. At that time, Joe Biden's son, Hunter, wa- had taken a position with one of the largest companies, gas companies, in the Ukraine for 50000 a month. Sorry? For 50000 a month. Now, the Obama... Dollars. Yes. Wow. Did I get one of those? So... Uh, no, because you're not Joe Biden's that son. Be Joe Biden's son. So, so what had happened is the uh, we know that happened. The Obama administration was deeply uncomfortable with it because they, they thought it was a massive conflict of interest. Oh, really? But Biden said, <laughs> "Yeah, I know, shocking." But Biden said he had followed all required um, federal guidelines and that it was perfectly legal and ethical. Yeah. So, what the Trump administration is saying is that. That investigator who Biden pushed to remove, Biden is saying he was involved in corrupt dealings. The Trump administration is saying that he may have been involved in corrupt dealings, but he was also investigating corruption in Ukraine, and that partially related to Joe Biden's son, Hunter, and that therefore Biden removed this investigator to stop a corruption investigation into his own son. So Biden's son, I think, is is a weak point for Joe Biden. Biden's son is, was, at this point, uh, hopefully still is, a recovering drug addict. There was a time, and we also know this mm-hmm. happened, when Joe Biden uh, went on Air Force Two, which is the vice president's pain, with his son Hunter to Beijing. And shortly thereafter, Hunter was given a $1.5 billion investment into his financial company by uh, the Chinese state which looks dodgy. Well, um, considering you don't generally give one point five billion to a recovering drug addict for no on reason. On the face of it, it's generous. It's maybe the Chinese government's way of saying, you know, keep at it, stick with it. All those in recovery, you too can be Joe Biden's son and get one and a half billion. But you know, it's a, it's a positive message. Well, I mean, I think the thing here is that. So he meets, he brings his son over to meet with Chinese Communist Party officials. His son had no reason to be there in the first place. Biden, until relatively recently, always refused to condemn the Chinese regime for any human rights atrocity. And so people are sort of going, well, are these two things connected? So it's now gone, it's now gone to impeachment. Trump definitely did threaten to withdraw military aid from Ukraine. But now they have to show that that's linked to these phone calls and not just because he thought that they didn't need it or he didn't want to give it to them. Right. Um, and yeah, that's that's the basic gist of it. That is what they're going to go... Now the, in- the investigation may go into other... Or the inquiry may go into other areas. There's a lot of areas they wanted to impeach about. But, um, but that's the way it will go. The risk here, the reason Pelosi didn't want to do this is because she thought, one, they wouldn't get it in the end, and two, if they did it, it would make the Democratic Party look, particularly after the Russia investigation, mm-hmm. like they just cannot accept the fact the man he's, the, that Trump is president, and that that would then mean that moderate Democrats, particularly in more purple states, would be seen as too extreme, and they would lose... They would lose most of the moderate states. Yeah. So they kind of think now that uh, maybe if they can get him on this Ukrainian thing, it's a good middle of the road 
way to do this where they can go, look, this was a legitimate scandal. Um, the problem they might have here is if stuff comes out about Joe Biden. Okay, Gary, so we'll, right now the Republicans are showing no interest in signing up to this. Uh, is there any scenario that we can see where that, 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 that could start to break down? I mean, what would have to happen for the Republicans to start to come on board? So... On a personal level, a lot of these guys don't like Trump. And I said there's a massive level of support for him amongst the grassroots. However, the Democrats can use this procedure to just keep hitting Trump if they can show that this was actually something scandalous. And, I mean, a lot of the Republicans are not terribly fond of Russia. So I would say the moderate GOPers may actually start to peel mm -hmm. away if they can find that this is, um, that this is something. And if they can't find it something, they can still use it to damage Trump. However, if Joe Biden... Joe Biden still looks like he's going to be their candidate. Warren may pull ahead, but Biden, I think, is, is probably going to be... At current polling, Biden is the one who's going to take She's in California, but she's, she's not... A, he's, he's ahead of her in the early states. And I suppose that, yeah, he, she's ahead of him in California. He's ahead of her everywhere yeah. else. But um, if Biden... If they go down this route and they start pulling things on this... And things start coming out about Hunter Biden and Joe Biden's involvement. Mm -hmm. They could actually end up scuttling their own candidate because Trump has shown an amazing ability to just refuse to be hurt by scandals. He just doesn't apologize. He just keeps attacking. And so they never seem to hurt him. Yeah, there's a, I don't know if it's a, a conscious thing with Trump. He keeps throwing mud. He keeps, and when it's, it, it gets to the point where you, you, the voter and the observer forgets where the whole thing started. And there's a general sense of, oh, well, the, they're equally bad. They're all at it. And he comes out basically... Also, a lot of the... You, you know this phrase that people have start, started using in politics, these are priced in. A lot of the stuff, the negative stuff that they're trying to attach to Trump, in a sense, I think the, the, the voter has priced in to Donald already. They're going. They're willing to put up with a fair deal of stuff from him that I think they probably they wouldn't put up with him with with another politician, or historically they wouldn't have put up with other politicians. But with Donald, they're willing to do it because, ironically, after I would say his first year, year and a bit, where he didn't do a whole lot, his second his second eighteen months has actually been pretty active, and very successful. And very orthodox conservative policy. In some ways, he's more active than Reagan or Bush were. I mean, it's it doesn't really get much uh, media attention outside of America, and really, it actually doesn't get that much media attention inside America. But the Heritage Foundation publishes a thing every year where they will grade Republican presidents on how much of the conservative agenda, as Heritage defines it, has been implemented that year, and Trump is currently scoring better than the Reagan administration. And I think that's because he just delegates yes. things. So he'll just go, who's good at this? All right, you take that and just implement whatever you want as long as it's in line. And it's a very business sort of approach of, I've set the overarching strategy. We've put people in who can uh, handle the different areas at a high level and we're just going to let them do it. Yeah. And as long as they get results, yeah. we don't care. I, I do get the kind of sense from them that, you know the way they say that a shark can never stop moving because then it will stop yeah. breathing? I do kind of get the sense with Trump that Trump, because he never stops moving for a scandal, he always attacks, he never kind of turtles, mm. he gets away with it. But I have a feeling that if he stops for any scandal, like any single yeah. scandal, they will all come from behind and he'll just be crushed by the weight of them all. Sort of like a wave constantly behind him. He just has to also, keep moving. Also, that sense that it, it, it doesn't necessarily in that case have to be a big one. It could be just dozens and dozens of micro scandals all happening at the same time. And all. But I don't think this will... We, we don't know, but Trump seems to have understood instinctively how to deal and how to use social media in a way that no other politician has done or does yet. How many, you and I have worked with politicians and who want to become more beloved and more successful and communicate better with their, 
their voters or their potential voters, and they always say to you, well, I need social media. I need Facebook, I need Twitter, I need social media. And my aunt, I always ask them, why? What for? What are you going to do with it? And they've no clue. But they know that it's something they have to have. But they've no actual, they've no real sense of what the thing is or what it might do. Trump, I think possibly, because he became a doyen of that world before he really ever got into politics. He knows, and one of the most important things he's learned is you don't apologise. There's an apology now. I mean, this was I, things have happened and have changed really quickly. I don't think this was true even five years ago. But now, apology is a waste of time. All apology does is it gives them extra f- fuel to continue this circular, this circular fire on, on, particularly on Twitter. And he just he plows through. It's, I, I mean, I know we've both talked to, to candidates and politicians of various sort of cre- crisis PR points. And yeah, the last kind of five, maybe even ten years have really become a sort of, sometimes you should just stop talking. Very rarely worth it to apologize. And I would draw the parallel with confession. You confess and you show contrition because there's yes. forgiveness. There's no forgiveness to these no, people. They All they will do is they will take your apology and fashion it into a weapon against you. So don't apologize. They, do, they would demand an apology, but it's a fake demand because actually it's just that's the first in a series of steps because they genuinely want to destroy you. At that moment, in that context, in that frenzy, they want to destroy you. you they want you to lose your job. They want you to be shunned by decent society. They want you boycotted to doubt. So, but Trump, Trump has that wonderful ability. He doesn't care. I, I can't remember what for. Humphrey Bogart was 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 once asked what was the best thing about success. He said, "I have, I have ten million dollars in the bank. That's what I call fuck you money." And he said, "What do you mean?" He said, "It doesn't matter. Anybody wants something from me that I don't want, I just look at them. I think of my ten million dollars in the bank, and I say fuck you." And Trump has that in spades, that attitude. If he gets, if not the dollars, I am. I'm not sure. I mean, the for the Democrats. The only way this would seem to work in their favour is if they don't impeach Trump at the end of this, but they can damage yeah. him. Because if they impeach Trump, then Mike Pence becomes president. <laughs> well, if and then they're not running against Trump in 2020. They're running against Mike Pence. They successfully. Now, well, I don't know. I mean, I think would you prefer... If you're, I think if I was Joe Biden, I'd prefer to run against Pence. I think, well, Pence normally. But what will happen is the Trump base will be so angry at the removal yeah. of Trump, that they will come behind Pence as well. So you'll have Pence's natural constituency yeah, huge. and the Trump you'll base. You'll be hugely and energized the... base. And Joe is many things, but Joe doesn't seem to me to be best place to energize the coalition. Democrats... Joe Biden barely seems to know what year at, it is when at he's the talking, moment, let alone what state At the moment, in. he does seem to go through a lot of senior moments. One of the things that we just... I think it's important to clarify here or mention is there has been this notion over the last decade or so evolving that the, the Democrats were moving into a permanent majority at the, at the federal level because of the change of demographics. But what we've seen actually from the Trump election is that this is only true if you can energize all of the members of the coalition the members of the coalition are Latinos, uh, African Americans, women, and or other minority groups. Well, they also the the Democrats also have a big problem here in that they assumed that certain minorities would become less religious and more progressive over mm-hmm. time. And what we're seeing from uh, the Hispanic and Black communities is not that. And the, the most left wing people in the Democratic Party now are college-educated, upper-middle and upper-class white people. They are yes. more progressive on racial issues than the minorities they claim to represent. And, and so I think there is a yes, large I think there is a large opportunity there for the Republican Party, particularly with Hispanic voters and to a certain extent black voters, because when you look at particularly black voters on social issues, most of them are straight down the line Republican on and, social issues, yeah, like religious Republican. Absolutely, but that's... That's been true for a long time. They've never succeeded in getting out. Now, well, 
there have there have been Bush times did when try and to reach out and did have some success. The last, the last fifty years, the Republicans have never managed to capture the black vote uh, to the extent that Democrats yeah. have. But before that, there were periods where the Republicans had pretty much what the Democrats have on the black Absol- vote there. Yeah, the, yeah. So I, I don't think writing it off no, is no, impossible. It, it should be absolutely not writing it off. Uh, but also, I, I think that the, thing, the, the, the thing to remember is you don't need to have to go back to the days when Martin Luther King was friends, not with John F. Kennedy, but with Robert Ni- with Richard Nixon. They were, he and his wife were actually friends. It's the political uh, accord happens with the Democrats afterwards, but the friendships are they are naturally Republican. They're, that's where he starts his life. That's where political blacks in the southern states were. And in the north, you were Republican. No, my point is that the, the coalition demands that you get high turnouts from all of these groups. So you have to get over 90% African-American turnout and vote say, slightly less with the Latinos and, and the women uh, have to be, there has to be a strong over 10% by uh, bias for women. The problem is that if the Republicans make any kind of, they don't have to win half the black vote. All they have to do is get that 90% down to 85%. That's as little as they have to do on both sides, on, say, with the Latinos and black American, African Americans, for the coalition to fail at a federal level. They don't need to make huge numbers. Five, five percent, ten percent, eighty percent, down eighty percent, and it's a, it's, it's a nightmare. It's a whitewash. It's a, probably a poor choice of words, but it's, it's a, it's a, it's a landslide situation if the Republicans can get between 15 and 20 percent of the of the african-american votes yeah they'll, they'll crush them i mean o- overall i think this is this is i mean they might get lucky they might get rid of trump but i think they need to keep trump there and damage him and they're also taking a big risk with biden because if this thing goes until the election and you have what 18 yeah. months 18 months of joe biden trying to avoid answering questions about his drug addict yeah, son they're, they're, and payments to him the, that's not yeah, going to help the big risk with biden but then well, I think that you say, well, number two, who's number two? Elizabeth Warren? You think Elizabeth Warren isn't a risk of a different kind? Uh, but Elizabeth Warren, it seems to me, has all of the negative characteristics that Hillary had, none of the positives. Elizabeth Warren, had she... I, I would have thought... I think if you look at her reaction to Donald Trump's calling her Focahontas, yeah. where she took a genetics test, and then even though it showed her to have less Native American heritage than the average American. Yeah. She still published it as if it was a win. Yeah. That showed a shocking level of just blindness towards her own uh, campaign. Yeah. And her lack I of mean, self-awareness. Did you, uh, have you seen the... Um, there's a Photoshop of her... Um, her campaign is basically... The logo is basically Warren 2020. And someone has changed it to read Warren one in 2020th <laughs> to represent her Native American heritage. Right, and all I all I can see is her going against Trump, and Trump just taking shot, just shot. after shot she after shot at her, and she, and she will respond as she did to the Focahontas one, and she'll scuttle her. Also, own there is to remember likely. that there is potentially there was potentially a crim, a criminality, at least malfeasance, uh, behind her claim to be Native American, because at least in part, one of the things that played a part in her becoming a full professor uh, her was the fact that she was she came into an she came in as she 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 ticked an ethnic box shall we say and whether or not that she would have got that position or whether or not she achieved getting that position in a completely straightforward and honest fashion would start to become an issue but even if we say it's not Warren you say it's Sanders I mean Sanders you, what kind of risk is what kind of risk is running a candidate who is now proposing a tax on rich people that would mean that Jeff Bezos, this is to fund his healthcare initiative, would uh, Jeff Bezos would be spend would be paying nine billion a year in tax? I don't think the American, the I think that Biden, yeah, he's a risk, but I think that he's not the only he's not the only risky candidate that they're looking at. Well, no, but I think Biden is going to win at current yeah, polling. He'll win. He'll win. 
And I think he's the he's the guy that can talk to that part of Middle America that the Democrat has to talk to. Now, it will be very funny if Biden goes forward for candidate and allegations of sexual assault and sexual impropriety start surfacing very, very rapidly. Because I would say the Republican Party has a couple. Well, and they're not going to release them until he's chosen as the candidate. But Biden has a reputation, and not a good reputation, uh, on he, his approach towards he, women, particularly well, younger he's, women. he's considered to be touchy-feely. Yes, as anyone who's seen the... Uh, he when he when he launched his candidacy, he didn't buy the Joe Biden website, yeah. and someone bought it and just filled it with photos of Joe Biden touching women who look uncomfortable. <laughs> and, it, and they do look really uncomfortable. It's There's not, not so nice. many of them. But anyway, exactly. quickly, I suppose before we um, yeah, well, before we run, yeah, we the IOC guidelines. Oh yeah, very quickly. So explain explain to the people that the IOC has. Uh, it's, well, not to come to a conclusion, rather the opposite. Talks have broken down. Yeah. So the IOC is the International Olympic Committee, and they are the people who put in the rules for Olympic Games. So the Tokyo 2020 Games are obviously running in 2020, and they have been trying to put in place rules for transgender athletes. They already have rules, but they've been trying to revise them before the 2020 Games. It looks like they're now not going to get that. So... Here is some. Here is a little bit of technicality. So men and women have different levels of testosterone in their body. And usually the way they do this is they put a limit on how much testosterone you can have in your body and still compete in women's events. That is the kind of happy medium they have for uh, transgenderism. <clears throat> yeah. So if you're a woman, you'll probably have between 0 0.12 and 1.79 uh, nanomoles per liter of testosterone. Men will typically have between 7.7 .7 and 29.4 nanomoles per litre. So that is not a small difference. I mean, that is a fantastically large difference. It's a lot of the reason men are stronger and uh, faster in most uh, cases. So generally what they've said is, or the current rule is that you transgender athletes have to have less than 10 nanomoles per litre to go in as a woman. Now that is to say, if 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 on the low range a woman can have 0 0.12 and a transgender athlete can have 10, that is still an ungodly difference. That's a huge difference. I mean, I don't know proportionately what effect these things have, so whether or not it has to be that big a difference to make an effect. There, it is a weird situation because there's a lot of debate amongst um, academics on this. However... I think if you go into any gym or you talk to people who've been involved in strong man or even bodybuilding mm -hmm. and you ask them about steroid use in their sport, I would say the most common steroid use is testosterone because it gives exceptional results. So the actual research is <clears throat> sort of a lot of fairly up in the air, but anyone I've talked to who's dealt with the actual real world application right. of these things, testosterone it is just works. wonder drug for doing okay. better. So, and there's recently been some new research that came out that said, even when transgender people go on testosterone suppression, it doesn't reduce their uh, muscle mass uh, substantially, it doesn't reduce their muscle strength, even after a year, which is to say, uh, someone who's gone from a man to a woman is still roughly as strong as they were when they were a man. They are slightly weaker. And they'll find training more difficult mm -hmm. because testosterone has other impacts. Yeah. But they are nowhere near the level of a woman. So the IOC, some of them were trying to reduce the level to five nanomoles. That's to say they were trying to half it. Now that would still be, you know, as I said, a woman is between 0 0.12 and 1.79. So to bring it to five is still to have a, a very high level compared to most yes. of the women. But the problem is, is they found that the situation is so political and so divided that they can't sign off on it. There's no consensus position on that. Well, one of the... And it's not based on the science. No. The science is pretty clear on this. Their problem is that this is a political and uh, social no, issue. They don't want to look it bad. Never, it was never going to be based on the science because this discussion wouldn't be happening if, well, if, if we talked about science. This is purely a political sort of thing. 
And, and this this actually does have quite a large uh, impact here because loads of places are holding off so they can see what the IOC is yeah. doing. So if the IOC doesn't do anything, a lot of the smaller clubs and more regional uh, representative bodies aren't going to do anything. And if the IOC goes one way or the other, a lot of the other places are going to follow because it's it's the Olympic Committee. So this is of great interest to a lot of people. So I'd say they're coming under quite a lot of I pressure. Mean, one of the things I want to make the point here is that one thing that's happened on in this, again, very quickly, this is one of the remarkable things anybody's been paying attention to this as you and I have been doing for the last few years is the speed at which positions change in advance is, is quite remarkable. What would have been an absolutely outlier position a few years ago is now becoming more and more within the, the the activist trans community the position to take which is and this is the the long term you, know, so you don't have to you shouldn't have to take any kind of hormonal drug you shouldn't have to engage in suppression you shouldn't have to have any kind of body al- body alteration or surgery if you are happy enough to stay in the body that you're inhabiting, what should be enough is simply the statement that you are the gender of your choice and that people uh-huh. should be compelled to ex- to simply accept that fact and that you should engage in the world as if you were the gender of that choice, as you should, as you chose. Michael, do you know why there are, there is a sex division in sports? Uh, what I, <laughs> yes, I think I do. I think that in the same way as you have handicaps in horse races, you have divisions in football. It's to make the thing, it's to make the spectacle more enjoyable and the sport more enjoyable. Because if you didn't, one group would bait the hell out of the other group on a just depressingly regular basis. Yeah. So this, when someone comes forward and says it's discriminatory to not allow transgender women to compete based upon like they shouldn't have to do these things. They're right. It is absolutely discriminatory. It's also a safety issue. But the nature, the nature of male and female sport, like having sex segregated sport, is also discriminatory. But I mean, this is the thing that really actually annoys me when people say something is discriminatory, and they assume that means it's yeah. wrong. Where you can have justifiably discrim, you can have justifiable discrimination, and you can have unjustifiable discrimination. If there was not sex segregation of sports. There would be no women's sports. No. There would be a gender equal sporting field where everyone there was a man. Because on average, men are faster, they are taller, they are stronger. And people say, well, I, you know, not all men. No, but athletes are not the general population. They tend to be the extremes. Have, and on the extremes, it's just you men. You would have, women would be involved at the top level in horse any equine events, dressage, show jumping, horse racing, <coughs> because the horse does a lot of the leg work there. At curling, you would have you'd have some you have some women in curling. Uh, I'm struggling now. Um, I don't know ten pin bowling. I mean, I have like I, snooker. I know people who have snooker. It shouldn't make any difference in snooker, but it does. No woman has ever successfully got involved at a seriously high level of snooker and pool, even though there are, in the case of pool, thousands of women who play uh, pool. It, the, it may be... Sim- well, actually, there, there, is, there, is, there is an interesting point there. Men actually have substantially better hand-eye coordination and more, as well as being stronger, men generally have more precise control of the larger muscle groupings. Well, if we're going to take an so, evolutionary view of this and say that men are evolved to spot... Uh, pursue and kill prey well that would it would make sense that we have evolved and adapted in that way i don't know if that's over simplistic but you know it's perspective but i can't I, i'm outside of horses and curling um croquet perhaps i don't know where no there, where where are, we, where are we going to see women left in sport there are there are certain long sports distance where they swimming remain maybe. competitive Swimming? Long yeah. distance swimming, not short distance. They're more buoyant. But in the vast majority of cases, you would simply see males dominate. Now, I've talked to people, people who legitimately have PhDs and not in nonsensical subjects, who will say that the only reason that men are stronger is uh, because society tells women they're not as strong, which 
if you I, I, I do love that the idea that evolution could not have produced this but society could I think is is delightful yeah. if that's your position I'd like to see some proof on mm. it because indications are that that's not correct so yeah it, it is discriminatory to ban transgender athletes but it's also unfair not to ban them yes uh, if you if you care about sport and you care about, but let's not mistake these people for caring about women because they don't no there is actually a great the guardian did a piece on this and they uh, they brought in joanna harper who's a transgender academic who advises the ioc mm. and this is her quote transgender women after hormone therapy are taller bigger and stronger on average than cisgender women but that does not necessarily make it unfair. Mm. Really not not yeah. necessarily. I think that's we could be a little bit mealy mouse. I am um, I it reminds me of um Fallon Fox, who was an MMA fighter. Not a terribly good MMA fighter, who transitioned to a woman. Yes. And yeah, yeah. there was a doctor's report to see was this fair. And I remember there was a line in it that said that a Fallon Fox would have increased bone density versus her opponents. But that this was deemed to give her no uh, material advantage. Mm. And then in her first fight, she uh, she shattered in her opponent's eye socket. Yeah. Uh, she did, then did lose handily because she was not terribly good and was merely relying on greater strength. And eventually one of the women took her out and she didn't do terribly well. But it then goes on to say, um, in high levels of sport, transgender women are substantially underrepresented which isn't actually true in a lot of the sports, particularly running. That indicates that whatever physical advantages transgender women have, and they certainly exist, they are not nearly as large as the sociological disadvantages, which is a statement with no proof behind it. The first part, she's right. They're taller, bigger and stronger. The second part is just conjunction. But it is also true, uh, but it doesn't, it doesn't answer her. Or rather, it, just, it doesn't necessarily... Uh, confirm her point, but it is true that transgender, uh, people presenting with transgenderism tend to have a a lot of comorbidities. You know, they do, but you know it would be a very interesting way to, to not solve this, but to do a little bit of research on it. An open category. Yeah. Just anyone can race. Anyone at all. And we'll see... One, it would give us a great chance to see how transgender athletes do against women, but it would give us a direct comparison uh, of male versus female because we can look at the times and men dominate yeah, across many things. But it'd be interesting to see if they're competing against yeah. each other. Would there be? I any would change? like to see that tennis match where Novak Djokovic plays Serena Williams, not because of anything against Serena Williams. I, I'm actually a fan, but just just to demonstrate. For all those people who've had, I, with whom I've had this conversation over the years, that yes, the gap is real and the gap is big. You put well, Djokovic. We know, we know the gap is. Or, yeah, but people. You, yeah, yes. Like but, we, we, but, but there, there was a match where both Williams sisters played back to back against two hundred and twelfth ranked but men that, and lost. That was a game, and he had a beer at half time, and it wasn't taken seriously. Proper serious sport with money. And you put Rafa, Rafa Nadal, yes, Rafa Nadal, because Rafa is just grunt. He's big. Rafa is testosterone on a tennis court. On a slow court, you put Rafa on a slow court against Serena, and Serena may have more shots than Rafa, and I think she probably does. And she may have more nuance and more whatever, but my God, it would be six love, six love, six love all day. Anyway, I think maybe that will leave. Uh, I will leave our dear listener to return to the desk or to the prairies, depending on where he is or she. And we will be back later in the week with our roundup. So, for the time being, enjoy your week. And it's goodbye from me. And goodbye from me.